Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Antonio Rejola. I'm the president of the Inter-America Commission of Human Rights. I'm also the rapporteur for indigenous people. We will start today the hearing for the case 13,752 Celia Edith Ramos Duran against Peru. Um, Today I are with me, Commissioner May, Margaret May Macaulay, that is a rapporteur for women's rights and also the country rapporteur, Commissioner Estuardo Rallon are here with me. I would like to apologize if I have connectivity issues, but I'm working from my phone. I also would like to welcome the representatives of the states and the representatives of the petitioner. There is uh, Celia, it is Ramos Durand. This is a case hearing. And therefore, we need to follow the protocol that apply for the knowledge that is uh, of the case. First, I would like to give the floor to the Assistant Executive Secretary to present the case. Marisol, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. The case has to do with the alleged uh, responsibility of the state for the forced sterilization of Celia Edith Ramos Duran, who was subjected to a surgery without valid consent and in unsafe conditions, and that uh, she died as a result of that surgery. Uh, those events took place under the National Reproductive Health and Family Planning Program for 1996-2000, which was approved under the administration of former President Avalto Fujimori. The petition said that the policy focused on voluntary surgical contraception, particularly for women, above all, from low-income groups with the goal of reducing poverty. In its uh, report 24 19, uh, that is the admissibility report uh, from 2019, the commission said that if the alleged sterilization of the victim without its their, her consent in uh, an unsafe conditions that led to her death, and the delay in the identification of those responsibles and the denial of justice could imply violations of Article 4, the right to life, 5, personal integrity, 7, freedom, uh, 13, freedom of expression, 24, equality before the law, 25, legal protection, and 26 of the Inter-American uh, Convention on Human Rights regarding its Articles 1.1 and Article 7 of the Convention of Elem do Pará. This uh, hearing uh, was granted by the Inter-American uh, Commission officially, and the parties have the opportunity to deepen the allegations on the merits. I would like to give the floor to Madam President. Thank you, Marisol. Before uh, starting with the allegations, I would like to tell all the people in the audience that we have a simultaneous interpretation and also, we have uh, subtitles for those who are uh, uh, hearing pairing. So we, you have on the screen, you will see the subtitles, and also you will have the icon for the simultaneous interpretation. Now. I'm sorry not to be able to say anybody else, but uh, now I would like to give the floor. We will give the floor 30 minutes uh, to the petitioners. And after that, the state will have 30 minutes to present its allegations and the petitioner will be able to use uh, the floor for uh, five minutes and then the state will have another five minutes and after that the commission will ask the questions for seven minutes and finally there were, will be a, some closing remarks of five minutes for each of the parties and so first I would like to give the floor to the petitioner for 30 minutes on the screen you will have a timer that is uh, 
uh, counting the time. So please try to respect the time limits or restrictions. Otherwise, I will have to, alle uh, to interrupt your presentation. Please introduce yourselves uh, as you take the floor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Madam President, Commissioners, representatives of the state. My name is Milto Campos. I'm from the law firm, I'm from Demos. Uh, with Elizabeth, my colleague, we represent the victim uh, and uh, whose relatives who are here with us today. We would like to thank for calling upon this hearing because we think it's very timely that there is a merits report for this case. This afternoon, we will present the case of the uh, forced uh, surgical or forced sterilization by uh, doctors during a campaign under the National Reproductive Health and Family Planning Program for 1996 2000, uh, which led to uh, Celia's death. We will talk about first the violations of human rights. We will present some new evidence. And after that, we will present our request. To start with, I would like to give the floor to Maricela, that is one of the daughters of Celia Ramos. Good afternoon, commissioners of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. We are Maricela, Emilia, and Marcia. We are the daughters of Celia Ramos. Our mother died after complications of a forced sterilization surgery in 1997. During that time, the government of uh, Alberto Fumidore uh, had a family planning program that made uh, caused a lot of suffering to women in Peru. Our mother died when we were 9, 11, and 5 years old. 23 years have passed, and we would like to tell you what we could not say before. It's been very difficult to talk about this issue for many years. To avoid this was obvious in order not to cry. Those accused for the death of my mother who insisted that she should uh, uh, sub be subject to the sterilization surgery, they don't know what is to live without her. We cannot face that pain. My uh, sister Emilia feels that it, it was yesterday and my other sister is still suffering the loss and I cannot explain how I feel about missing my mother at every stage of my life. I remember the days before the surgery. Every day there was a nurse that was talking to my mother for a long time and I remember the conversation between my mother and her friend. My mother said, Silvia, I'm scared. It seems as a simple surgery, but I'm scared. It's just some minutes and then you go back to your house. My, uh, her friend uh, told her that she was visited, but she decided not to uh, take the surgery. Now everything makes sense. In July 1997, on the, the, on the 3rd of July 1997, was the last day that we saw our mother. In the afternoon, Anand went to the clinic to learn why my mother did not return home. She was, she received a lie. She said, they said that she had a tumor and that's why there were a lot of complications. My mother spent 19 days at the clinic. We couldn't see her because um, minors of age were not allowed in. I cannot imagine how hard it, ha it has had been for my parents for my father and my family to hide all the things that were happening. The death was an impact for the whole family. We couldn't go to the burial and the days after her death, we were full of distractions in order to avoid the pain. Our father took care of us together with my grandmother. Our father and our mother had a project to build our house. This project was interrupted and that changed our family. After the death of my mother, the family was destroyed. There were no family meetings or gatherings. The three of us have been affected differently over time. We were hardest sometimes because we didn't have our mom. 
uh, Marcia, my sister, remembers that when the Mother's Day came, uh, some uh, children asked ourselves, why are you preparing something if you don't have a mom? Uh, we know that our mother died because of a negligent act, but now we know the consequences of that act. And now we need to honor our mother. We feel angry because 20 years have passed and it's unfair. What more do you need? What other evidence we should present? And that shows how unfair our country is. We know that what happened to other, our mother happened to other women. It was not the only person that suffered horrible things. And that's why we are here. We want to fight for those women Many of them cannot or, uh, express what they have suffered or do not have access to legal aid. That's why we need to fight for truth and for justice. Thank you very much. 25 years have passed since the beginning of the forced sterilization policy of Fujiro, Fujimori during the internal armed conflict. The state of Peru well, did not care about the right to decide of over 1,500 women who belong to indigenous peoples and who lived in rural areas. Up to now, those who have survived do not uh, enjoy the uh, they did not enjoy the right to justice and to right. The Reproductive Health and Family Planning Program 1996-2000 did not guarantee the human rights and the reproductive and family planning rights of these women. They did not care about uh, prior free and informed consent in the mother tongue and in written when, it, uh, when it's about irreversible surgery methods. In 1997, between 1995 and 1997, a lot of uh, sterilization surgeries were carried out without respecting international standards of human rights. In the case of Pura, between 1996 and 1997, over 18,000 sterilization surgeries were carried out plus 2,500 sterilization surgeries carried out between 1996 uh, and 1997. Former uh, member public official uh, that were the uh, vice minister and minister of the Ministry of Health during the uh, period in which Celia Ramos was uh, subject to the sterilization surgery were submitted to several complaints due to serious violations of human rights. After 16 years of preliminary investigations, there are enough evidence and legal basis to say that Alberto Fujimori prepared and planned this policy from the very beginning of, its administ of his administration during the year of austerity and family planning. And there is the first reproductive health program of his government that modifies in an express way, in a quick way, the law on population of 1995 that includes voluntary surgical contraception as a contraception method. However, there were no legislative and administrative changes that would guarantee the reproductive rights of women according to human rights standards. In 1997, the general health law is modified or amended in order to demand informed consent in written if, the, if there, there was an irreversible surgery uh, procedure. Fujimori and former ministers of health plan and executed a policy of sterilization surgery that was massive. And the power apparatus help the Ministry of Health in order to execute the policy. Then they promote incentive and encourage the 
and systematic violation of human rights in order to reduce the birth rate uh, and so that women could achieve levels of autonomy and could leave poverty behind. However, the program uh, for reproductive health and family planning make some, made some territories a priority and some women a priority. The goal of reducing uh, maternity death was not achieved. The Department of Fura is still in poverty. 7,000 women are still in poverty. They have been abandoned. They are stigmatized. They, stigmatized. they have no access to reproductive, psychological, mental health services, legal assistance. In spite of decades of organized fights, it was a state policy that was racist, uh, sexist that tried to colonize the bodies of women. It was a criminal policy. And the members of the Fujimori administration still deny this policy. The current candidate that represents Fujimori considered that this was mistakes of doctors. Alejandra Inada, vice minister of health at that time, when Celia Ramos was killed, and now she's a candidate to the Congress of the Republic and she defends and insults and denies what has happened. I'd like to give the floor now to Milton Gambo so that he can summarize the facts and that he can continue presenting the case. On July the 22nd, 1997, that's a date that it's unforgettable for the daughters of Celia Ramos, for her family, for the family of a woman that was sterilized out of the thousand women that were sterilized in Peru. But what did her family do afterwards? Her husband denounced these facts in Pura, and the public ministry conducted an investigation that ended up with an irregular file of this investigation saying that it couldn't be determined, that is to say that the original causes that caused the death of Celia Ramos could not be clarified. It was, they called or they talked about uh, money given to the husband, to her husband, given by, given by the medical group, showing that it was a random case applying the principle of opportunity. Then the prosecutor was received a lawsuit because of what he has done, but the prosecutor changed the file saying that the file created was because of the lack of elements, that they didn't have enough elements in order to continue investigating the facts as crimes. This is unbelievable for all the representatives and for the victims that this case was closed like this for her family. There were testimonies and declarations and statements about the precarious conditions of the health clinic, um, statements of the doctors saying how severe her medical condition was. Then there was also wrong information about the condition and the evolution of Celia Ramos. So let me remind you that one of the family members went to the clinic. They said that it was that this is a tumor, and they gave him a, a sample of the tumor, saying that's why things got complicated, and we took her to another clinic, clinic in Piura. All that was fake. That's false. As they didn't have the medical record, the case was closed and left aside, applying the principle of opportunity. What happened later on with the Peruvian system in 2002, the judicial power fostered investigation by means of a prosecution office in Lima, where they investigated other people involved. They included 
more than 2,000 women as victims, among which, among whom there was Celia Ramos. This was closed as well because they didn't consider this case as a serious violation to human rights, and they applied the prescription or they, they, they applied the expiry date saying that this case, that, that is to say the forced ser sterilizations, was not a violation to human rights and it was not a violation to a public policy. Fortunately, in 2011, this was amended and the prosecution's office opened the case again, reopened the case. So in 2012 and 2013, to Fujimori and the rest of his ministers were investigated. However, in 2014, the victims, such as Celia Ramos, have to be notified again about a new file. This time, the complaint was only one fact. What had happened to American Estanza, to another case, while Celia Ramos, I'm sorry, his audio is breaking, while Celia Ramos and the other women only had to content themselves with the original file. In 2015, this was corrected, but still, the way in which the public ministry, okay, his audio, his audio completely broke. Now this time, there was a new complaint, including seven women. Was Celia Ramos' case included there? No, it was not. She, as the rest of the more than 1,000 women, was still had still their cases pending. Years later, there was another file correcting this investigation. And in this case, it was ordered to file a lawsuit against Fujimori and his ministers because of forced sterilization to five women that were dead, among whom was Celia Ramos. Thousands of women that survived were also included in that case. That was um, presented to the um, and there was a hearing organized in December 2019, but it has been rescheduled twice. And it was only on March the 1st this year that we could actually start this hearing that is ongoing. Upon the criterion on the victims, it is not conducted with due diligence by the, by the state. Now, I would like to tell you the vulnerations or the vulnerabilities that Celia Ramos was subjected to. So I will give the floor to my colleague. Honorable Commission, the responsibility of the state is for the violation of human rights of Celia Edith Damo Ruran as follows. Violation of the right to life. It is not only a question that they arbitrarily deprived her of her life, but also of the possibility of a dignified life and her project, her life project to her daughters, her mother, her family. Celia Ramos was a victim of this deprivation because of the responsibility of the state and because of a policy that was not only sterilizing her without her consent, without their prior and informed and free consent, but also she was sterilized in absolutely precarious conditions and unsafe conditions in a place where they didn't have enough equipment to deal with any medical complication whatsoever. So she was not, she, she didn't die, she was killed. Vulnerability to the personal, to personal and dignified uh, rights. The integrity, personal integrity, is very much related to the right of health. In terms of women, their protection implies the obligation of the states to ensure that they can have the highest possible level of physical and mental health, sexual and reproductive health. Mrs. Celia and her family had their personal rights violated and personal integrity violated. The violation to the right to uh, protection, to judicial protection, there are some rulings that condemn 
the health staff that harassed her, that caused her death, because they were not prepared to deal with any kind of medical complications in such a, a procedure as a forced sterilization that had to be conducted together with other 15 women. She was told that this was a short surgical operation. No, there was nothing whatsoever. Is there any ruling for the perpetrators? There has been more than 18 years have elapsed already. And we are asking for a hearing to see which are the charges for the perpetrators. Violation to the right of thought and expression, access to information and informed consent. As I've repeated and said before, let the state show, show us and prove whether the program of reproductive health and family planning if that complied with the standards of human rights or the ombudsman in their report did not conclude that the rights were, were violated and recommended that it had to be corrected. The program was created in 1996 and in 1997, they asked for prior and written consent an informed consent. So only when the ombudsman asked for it to have a reasonable deadline or a different time for this informed consent was it included. So Mrs. Ramos went to a clinic and she was immediately, uh, she immediately had a surgery conducted on the right for equal protection and together with Article 7 of Belen do Pará, the Article 7 of the Belém do Pará Convention is mentioned here because we want to emphasize that in the practice of this forced sterilization process, this is a way of violence against women, which affects all their rights, rights to reproductive autonomy, to personal freedom, personal integrity, reproductive health. Therefore, Miss Celia could not continue her life. Her daughters could not continue their lives either. And they were also deprived of the fact of the dignity to continue living. Dr. Campos is going to add more evidence that ratifies what we are notifying the commission of. At this time, I would like to mention the three decisions that were made by entities of the state. That is to say, the public ministry, the constitutional court, and the Ministry of Justice. In terms of the public ministry, as we've mentioned before, since 2018 in the investigation 29-2011, there was a complaint that included Mrs. Celia Ramos Durand as a victim that had not survived. This was done, uh, dear commissioners and Madam President, this was done in 2018. More than two years have elapsed and still, we did, they didn't find the opportunity for the prosecutor to present the complaint to the judge. More than two years have elapsed since this event. And we are still undergoing, I mean, this is an ongoing hearing. This hearing has been rescheduled and rescheduled. Sometimes they even notify us through WhatsApp that it had been rescheduled. In that hearing, where, the, where they don't have any translation or interpreting services for Quechua speakers. Two years, this hearing was supposed to be held on the following days. However, that was not the case. The state continues violating the human rights of Celia Ramos, her family, and of thousands of women that were victims of these forced sterilizations that have this kind of judicial protection, but in this case, it is not complied with. The Constitutional Court in the country has a file 
that in October last year made a statement. I mean, the court made a statement because Mr. Marino Costa Bauer, who is one of the of the investigated people in the case of Celia Ramos, he wanted to close the case. Once again, I mean, for the fourth time, he would have closed the case. Of course, they said it didn't proceed, that it didn't apply, but we want to emphasize something. The fact that led to this investigation, that is to say it forced serialization of Celia and of thousands of women, that needs to be investigated. And there should be a statement for the serious violation to her human rights. The, the violations to human rights also need to be investigated with a serious commitment by the state. And this goes against the warranty that 20 years have elapsed since the events and that the state has not been able in throughout all this time to give any significant answer in this regard. However, the Constitutional Court warns that the delays in the administrative process and the criminal process will not match the right to truth and that they need to respect human rights of everyone. So this decision was taken in October 2020, five months afterwards. Dear members of the commission, we are still on the same page. Finally, I will talk about the decision made by the Ministry of Justice. In the Ministry of Justice, after five years, five years after the state in 2015 acknowledged that they had conducted forced sterilization. They created a report of victims for of forced sterilization. Finally, they granted Celia Ramos a few months ago the condition or the acknowledgement as a victim of forced sterilization produced between June 1995. Okay, he's breaking. The same recognition that is being done to the rest of the women in the country. So this sector of the state acknowledges, admits, that this case is part of the sterilization policy that was implemented in the previous years, in the years that we previously mentioned. Next, as we, I know that we are running out of time, but I still think I have a few minutes to mention this, we will make the petition. According to what has been presented so far regarding this case, since 2010, when in July we presented the first petition, we request respectfully to the Commission to adopt and make a merits report for this case, showing that this case should continue in the Inter-American Court, having been notified and proved that the Peruvian state violated the rights to freedom to personal integrity, access to information, to creating a family, to the judicial protection of Celia Ramos and her family, acknowledged in Article 4, 5, 7, 13, 8, 25 of the Convention, the convention and in relation to Article 1.1. At the same time, it has been proved that the Peruvian state is responsible for the violation of the right to equal protection acknowledged in Article 24. Oh, I'm sorry, he's breaking. No, we lost. We lost him. As there was discrimination against Celia Ramos. Her three daughters who are present here today and the rest of the family members have told us that we should ask the state to make a thorough review and investigation of the forced sterilization of their mother. 
this is added to other petitions and, and requests that we've done and that we will expand during the replication time. So I'll give the floor to my colleague, Marisa, Marisa Bell. Commission, I ask you for two more minutes in order to wrap up our request. We want the state to adopt non-repetition measures, but that they will not only be um, reforms or legal reforms or just directives, protocol, guidelines that are not complied with later on because nothing is controlled and because they are not respected. The like state in our country is not re respected. They continue violating rights of sexual health rights or reproductive health rights for personal beliefs that can no longer be allowed. The state needs to train the professionals, the health professionals in their right for free consent and informed consent in their in the reproductive rights of women so that they know that they, it's not them who make their decision. It's women, the ones that have to decide on family planning, on informed consent. We need to give our consent before and we need to choose the method that we want to use. And for the future generations that the Ministry of Education might tell them what happened in the school, I mean, so that girls, since they are very young, they can know their reproductive rights and that they can pay attention to the recommendations of the ombudsman and in the case that they are not complied with or in any kind of friendly settlements, if that's not complied with and if there is no reparation for the victims because we don't have any policy, even if there was a recent reform that the Ministry of Justice wanted to do in terms of the reparations, but they are still that is still not agreed and not implemented. We need truth, justice and reparation for Celia Ramos, for her daughters, for her family, and for the rest of the women in La Legua, Tatataos, and for all the women of all different regions in Peru. No more impunity. Thank you uh, to all the petitioners. As I would like to especially greet the daughters of Celia Ramos and especially Maricela, who was the one that spoke, but also to the others who are present today in this hearing. Now I would like to give the floor to the state and they will have 31 minutes with 45 seconds. That is the time that the petitioners used if the state would, if they are willing to use all that time. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to share our presentation. Uh, we sent the presentation earlier today. Can you see the uh, screen? Yes. Thank you. So, first of all, Madam President of the Commission, uh, Antonio Rejola, Mr. Commissioner Estuardo Ralón, uh, Commissioners and representatives of the petitioners, good afternoon. Today, the representation of the state of Peru is made out of Dr. Miluca Cano, that is the coordinator of the National Court of Criminal Court, and Dr. Daniel Jarez, that is the coordinator of the Chief Prosecutor Office and also officials from the Public Prosecutor Office, from the Ministry of Justice, and from the Ministry of Health. The uh, Public Prosecutor Office includes also the lawyers Mauricio uh, Rojas, and also the Chief uh, Fiscal Prosecutor Carlos Minanio, and also I'm the Assistant Public Prosecutor. Uh, one important thing that we like to mention that this is a hearing related to the case of Celia Ramos Duran. The state will not make any opinions or comments outside of this context, in spite of what has been said by the representatives of the petitioner. 
I also would like to inform the Honorable Commission that the information that will be presented today on these slides, it could be a bit technical and a bit long. The state will send a report or the evidence that provides uh, support to this presentation. We also will make the comments regarding the new evidence mentioned by the representatives of the commissioners. We don't have any time to uh, challenge that evidence. An important point, and we should mention this, is the fact that the state regrets the death of Mrs. Celia Duran and has listened carefully to uh, her daughter's statement. After that, I would like to uh, briefly present the presentation of the state of Peru. I would like to say that the presentation will be divided in two thematic uh, aspects. The first is related to the investigation of the facts of the case by the public prosecutor office and also by the judiciary that is the one that decides in the last instance on the facts of this case. And there is a second aspect or second pillar that we would like to present today uh, has to do with the uses of the mechanisms of, for, of sterilization or um, the contraception methods. They will work on that, on that according to the uh, standards and the duty to cover health services, taking into consideration the regulations of Peru and taking into consideration international standards on human rights. The state does not want to anticipate its position regarding the facts because they are being in being are under investigation. However, representatives from the public prosecution office and from the Ministry of Justice will be participating in this hearing and will uh, provide information regarding the proceedings. After that, I would like to give the floor to the representatives of the public prosecutor office that will uh, start with this presentation. Thank you. Dr. Hara, we you're on mute. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, and also to all those who are taking part in this hearing. First, on behalf of the Public Prosecutor Office, I would like to thank the possibility of being here in this hearing. This hearing is an opportunity to show the actions taken by the state in the case Celia Did Ramos Durand. And also we reaffirm our institutional commitment to make all the efforts necessary to clarify the facts. According to our organic law, on the Peruvian constitution, the Office of the Public Prosecutor defends legality, persecutes the uh, goal of defending the interests of citizens. And from the very beginning, criminal proceeding should be carried out when there is a crime. We need to identify those responsible and request a sanction or a punishment according to the law, and also request adequate reparation for the harm that has been caused. In the case of a serious violation of human rights of one or several persons, though the proceeding should be carried out according to the standards of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, including due diligence, ex officio investigation, and comprehensive investigations, just to mention some. Regarding the constitutional role of the office, once the elements or the evidence has been collected, there should be a hypothesis regarding the facts. In the criminal proceeding, those elements will be presented before the judiciary, with the, which within the jurisdiction, they will continue with the investigation in order to clarify the facts and to determine the responsibility 
that uh, is relevant to the case. After making this clarification, it's necessary to mention the facts of our fiscal or our uh, hypothesis. On July the 3rd, 1997, in the uh, Casaria de la Legua Health Clinic uh, in the uh, Pura region, as part of the implementation of a national program of uh, reproductive health and family planning, Cele Roma Duran underwent a surgical uh, uh, procedure and due to medical complications, she was transferred to uh, San Miguel Health Clinic in Pura. She was unconscious, comatose, and with uh, severe brain damage. She died on July the 22nd, 1997. Uh, what has happened in the case of Celia Grames is a crime for serious injury, followed by death, within a context of serious violations of human rights. The facts occurred during the implementation of a family planning program of the administration then. This uh, surgical contraception uh, created several injuries and serious injuries uh, to a large number of women. Therefore, after the investigation of those facts, in the folder or file number 292011, a criminal complaint was presented before the judiciary with the file number 59 2019. And the immediate perpetrators included our former president Alberto Fujimori, Fujimori and other public servants of his administration as part of the file and the criminal proceeding, the case of Celia Ramos Duran is in the stage of allegations within the criminal provincial court specialized for organized crime. And this is since March the 1st, 2012. And the case is undergoing that legal in the prosecutor is currently evaluating the facts and the legal arguments and the thesis of the opening of a criminal proceeding against the seven people denounced reported for the facts of the case of Celia Duran is to be presented so it's important to highlight that today's case is especially complex and therefore the advancement of the pre-trial stage cannot be compared with those uh, cases or common cases. The facts are very serious and especially complex. There is a, this is a serious, serious injurious crime followed by death and this same situation affects over 300,000 women in a context of serious violations of human rights. Taking into consideration the date, the crimes belong to 1997. There is, a, there is some barriers to the access to information. And there are also several uh, victims and uh, perpetrators and these requests collecting a lot of evidence from different regions of the interior of the country. In the current context with the pandemic, this proceeding is even longer. The public prosecutor office understands the obligation to respond to the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights regarding the progress made and the pending issues regarding the cases. But also, as a human rights prosecutor, I also, I'm also sure that we need to let the representatives of the victim know that we are making efforts 
uh, in order to proceed in favor of Celia Ramos Duran and her family members. And they, that's why the specialized first provincial prosecutor office from Lima is, and we have a representative from that office, they are making all the efforts possible to advance on this case. It is also to, necessary to mention that the public prosecutor office is persecuting the crime, but the judiciary will determine the facts and will sanction the, those responsible for those facts. After this, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Milita Cano. She is the representative of the judiciary, so she continue with the presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jara. Good afternoon to all those present, Madam President of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Mr. Uh, commissioners, representatives of the petitioner party, and especially I would like to greet the daughters of Celia Ramos Durant. For me, it is an honor to be here and to be representing the judiciary of Peru. And to continue with the presentation of the case. Uh, in my presentation, uh, I will talk about five thematic aspects. I would like to give more information regarding the case of forced sterilizations that affected Celia Edith Ramos Durant. Also, I would like to mention first, the current situation of the investigation. Second, the typology of the facts. And after that, I would talk about the stage of the criminal proceeding. And after that, I will present a schedule of the criminal proceeding. And after that, I will explain the complexities or difficulties because of COVID-19. In this case, the judiciary is one of the state powers. And according to the constitution of Peru, it is an autonomous and independent power. According to article 139.2 of our current constitution says that no authority can deal with cases that are pending in the domestic uh, area and cannot inter interrupt their functions. And the solutions approved by the judiciary cannot be ignored. However, I need to mention that the judiciary is respectful and respects the application and enforcement of the Inter-American norms and subscribes to Inter-American Convention of Human Rights. And we also apply the international rules and the jurisprudence from the card. Talking about the first aspect that is a current situation of the investigation of the case, it is necessary to say that this case is and under the jurisdiction of the criminal judgment with the file number 59 2019 called or titled force sterilizations. This process is not under the guidance of the new criminal uh, code of procedures, uh, which has been uh, enforced since 2004. Uh, in this regard, the actions of the court follow what has been established in the code of criminal Pro codes. And in the hearing, this is regulated by article 77 of that code, which was amended by the legislative decree 1206 that regulate measures so that criminal proceedings are effective according or those that are processed under this code of proceedings. Also, we have article or another degree from one, uh, 124. 
There we have the report presented by the Office of the Public Prosecutor that created the file 59 to 19, and there has been a hearing to present the charges, and we have had several hearings, one on March, uh, the, on March the 1st, 2012, and also another one on March the 2nd, 2021. We know that the judge has a lot of burden and the person is one of the is presiding over one of the rooms or divisions of the Supreme Court that covers or addresses human rights violations. So he will explain the situation later. Regarding the second aspect that has to do with the typology of the crime, as you have listened to the prosecutor, the facts have been classified as serious lesions followed by death against Celia Ramos Duran and other four people. And also there is the crime against life, body and health, serious injuries followed by death. And there is uh, the case of Celia Ramos uh, Duran is aggravated and includes another 1,314 victims. The prosecutor already mentioned this. The public prosecutor office has typified the facts according to the code of Peru in the context of serious violations of human rights. And this is being reviewed by the judge or the court of the case. Regarding the sessions or the hearings that are being held to present the charges, I have been informed because I'm the coordinator of the system of organized crime and I am here to assist the judiciary. I was informed that in the last hearings, the our interpreters in the hearing and we will have these interpreters to support the role because we had uh, interpreters or teacher interpreters because the victims need to know the contents of the hearing in their original uh, language or the mother, that is the Quechua language from their region. So we will have interpreters for all the students of the case. The fourth aspect is the schedule of the proceeding. After presenting the charges, if the court considers that a criminal proceeding should be open, we will have the judicial investigation phase that will be within the common proceeding. In the Peruvian criminal law, this proceeding lasts four months and could be extended to another two months. As you have heard, the prosecutor says that this is a very complex case and therefore the, the court or the lower court could also mention this complexity and assign a longer period of time for the pre-trial pre phase. It's also necessary that you have think that you take into consideration the fact that Peru is also in a, within the global emergency for COVID-19. And therefore, this uh, prevents the work of investigation and also uh, stops the proceeding. However, our jurisdiction bodies are complying with the work that they have to do according to the constitution. And most of the hearings are virtual online through platforms that have been created and with a protocol so that all the parties can have access to justice in an ex uh, expedited way. And we are doing this um, following our in domestic laws, but also taking into consideration the recommendations made by the Inter-American Court. Thank you very much. I will give the floor to 
the next representative of the state. Madam President of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, Commissioners and representatives of the petitioners, good afternoon to you all. Sexual and reproductive health in Peru starts in the, in the 80s, in the 1980s, with regulations that show methods for the control of birth under a, democrat, a demographic perspective. Family planning in Peru has gone through different changes, social demographic changes, and from the perspective of law, that throughout the years, they've managed to improve the health of both men and women in Peru. The International Conference on Population and Development conducted, held in El Cairo in 1994, and the fourth World Conference on Women conducted in Beijing in 1995, showed a pillar, a cornerstone to overcome the demographic goals approach in our country. They managed to change the policies of the 80s with these goals. The previous uh, goal was based on achievements to an approach, a more law approach based on the promotion and, protective, on the, and the protection of reproductive rights focused on people. This transition of one approach to the next one has tried to be systematized in a timeline to show how the regulation evo evolution took place in the last 20 years. The evolution evolution of the regulation framework from 1996 to 2004 about sexual and reproductive health. As you can see, in 1996 up to 1998, the regulation framework of the health and reproductive health, reproductive health and family planning program, then in 1997, the Guidance, the guidelines and the manual of the procedures for contraception, for voluntary surgical contraception, you can see that all of them are focused on the family planning needs. However, then you will see that in the year 2004, as you can see on the slide, by means of a ministerial resolution of 2004, the ministry approves the national guidelines for the reproductive and sexual health complete care, where they change the approach and in this family planning, and they take a new approach based on the all-encompassing care and on reproductive and sexual health as such. There is so much of a change here that in the year 2008, in chapter seven, there is a specific module for family planning. That is to say, the concept of family planning in itself of the previous years changed into a wider concept that talks about sexual and reproductive health and then about an all-encompassing care, including all general aspects. In 2005 to 2020, you will be able to see that the regulation got stronger, a different approach, an approach where all sectors participate, participate that is a multi-sectorial approach, where the participation of civilians also plays a big role as well as the academia and other social players, consolidating an approach based on rights, on the rights of the users. And it has promotional protection of their reproductive rights. You can see it in the resolution of 2005, 
that is called Technical Regulation on Family Planning 2006, where you will see that it is based on the guidelines and advice for sexual and reproductive health 2008 by means of a technical document called Cultural Adjustments for Guidelines and Council on Reproductive and Sexual Health, and 2016, that is also an all-encompassing regulation that includes all the technical aspects and the, their respective modifications or amendments. As you can see, all these adjustments related to sexual and reproductive health to date, they show the right of people to have clear information, truthful information, to adjust the medical care to their own realities, to have a gender-based, with um, to have a kind of healthcare with a gender approach and interculturality. The pandemic, of course, and that is to say the answer of the ministry has been to adjust our services, their services to the pandemic or in the face of a world pandemic. Therefore, resolution 2017-2020 was passed of the Ministry of Health in order to ensure the health of mothers, pregnant women, and for family planning facing the situation of COVID-19. In order to implement all these regulations, we've conducted activities, dissemination activities by means of the Ministry of Health, creating information campaigns since 2005 onwards that are included in the Ministry of Health calendar. And they conduct two information campaigns at a national level per year. The first one is from the Ministry of Health and the second one is for the commemoration of the International Day of Family Planning. In those two campaigns, they provide all kinds of information about family planning, reproductive and sexual health rights to all the users of the national chain. In addition to this, we also have the regional departments of health that supplement this activity with regional and local activities according to their own planning of their operational plans and according to the specific needs that each region may have. This information is available on the website. You have the, the link there in case you want to continue reading or if you want to check some of these resources. In addition to this, the Ministry of Health has drafted regulation or information guidelines of all the contraceptive methods, in particular the ones that include voluntary surgical contraception. This has been spread or disseminated in, um, at a national level, and it's also, it is also included on the website where you can find more information. You have just one more minute left. The trainings conducted throughout this year, these are the trainings since 2016 to the current times, 3,265 health staff, health professionals uh, that are working in reproductive health, they've received training related to family planning, human rights, gender approach, interculturality, sexual and reproductive health, informed consent, prevention of violence, and attention to victims of sexual, uh, of rapes that come to these services. These trainings are also conducted by replication in each of the regional uh, organizations or regional agencies. In order to conclude, uh, Madam President and Commissioners, we would like to point out that family planning and sexual and reproductive health is a priority, it's a very important topic of the Peruvian state and government. Therefore, we have strengthened reproductive and sexual rights 
in this stage. And in this last few years, we are including the vulnerability factor, that is to say, to expand rights uh, to, and to focus on vulnerable groups, such as teenagers, and indigenous communities and rural communities of our country. Within the context of COVID, in order to wrap up, we have made sexual health a priority because of their impact to women. It is one of the first strategies that the country is implementing as part of their plans to fight the pandemic. Thank you. I want to thank the representation of the state. Now you, the petitioners have five minutes in order to recognize. Thank you. Okay, it's breaking. The first representative that took the floor already mentioned, we are gathered here because of the case of Mrs. Celia Ramos, but what are we talking about? on July the 22nd and July the 3rd. What happened during that period between the 3rd and the 22nd of July, 1997? What we will hear now is not an answer for Celia Ramos because she's no longer with us. The representatives of Celia Ramos have been able to show or to prove from the petition that we cannot talk about the case of Celia Ramos isol in, an, uh, in isolation, because if not, we wouldn't have heard all the people of the state talking about a national program, talking about an investigation with more than 1,000 cases of women in similar cases as Celia. So it is unthinkable of for us, for the, represent, for the representatives of the victim, that this implies a differentiation. Celia Ramos was, was forced to have a serialization process in Catacaos together with other women in an area that was precarious, with precarious conditions. Some of the operators that were part of this structure are currently being investigated? Well, the answer is no. Is there a current investigation? Yes. There is an ongoing hearing? Yes. How many years later? How many years later? Is there anyone that has been actually charged with anything because of what happened to Celia Ramos? No. So we are talking about vulnerability since 1997 onwards. I give the floor now. Oh, he broke, okay. Okay, honorable commission and representatives of the state. I would like to make the most of these few minutes that we have left in order to agree upon something. In the first place, we are not here to talk about the lack of justice, only against the people who are responsible only against the perpetrator by means. You have not shown or said anything regarding the closure and the delays and closure of the lawsuits against the medical staff that caused the death of Celia Ramos. Her daughters have the right to truth and the truth according to the ombudsman that should be here among the delegate amidst the delegation they said that it was illegally closed that that investigation was illegally closed and left aside that they used the principle of opportunity that was illegal for that kind of cases and that it was closed by an external agreement. Uh, external, I mean outside the justice system. 
Now, do you know what happens with, the, with that um, medical staff? You don't have to tell us. You, you don't need to tell the commission that I'm sure that they know very well everything that we've managed to advance against these kind of perpetrators by means. Now, have you seen, have you realized that such an investigation with the charges that, that we are presenting here, do you think it is logical that it will take 20 years against the perpetrator by means? Is that respecting the reasonable time? Would you please tell us if the justice that the daughters and her family and thousands of victims are waiting for is just? And are you telling us and the daughters of Celia Ramos and the victims that there is a framework on reproductive health that we managed thanks to everything that we've done and thanks to our efforts to bring these topics to the Inter-American Commission, we've managed to do that because at the time, back at that time, there was no such standard of international human rights. So let's be serious about this, representatives of the state. Let, do not re-victimize the victims. Thank you very much. I don't know what happened to the timer, but I think, um, I, I'm sorry, suddenly it read 20 minutes. It was not that, it was uh, 45 seconds that, that you spent more than, than a great. So now the, um, you, I will give the floor to the state for five minutes and 45 seconds. That was the time that it was actually, that actually elapsed. Thank you, Madam President. First of all, I would like to say that we've taken down note of everything that the representatives have said. We are analyzing the case of Celia Ramos Durand, regardless of the context. So, um, as we said at the beginning, the state, the Peruvian state, respects the autonomy of the judicial of the different entities. As Dr. Hara said, there is a hypothesis of the case. It has been presented to the judicial power, and the judicial power, in its autonomy, will have to decide or make a statement on some of the things that have already been mentioned by the representatives. We cannot give any advances on the opinion when we know that there is an ongoing process. That's the second point. Third, and I think that it's very important to point out, this hearing has supported us, has been not only um, we have participated with representatives of the different sectors of the state and representatives of the public ministry, the coordinators of the departments that are analyzing the cases of human rights with this approach that we were mentioning. In that regard, we are pointing out that in the current context, which is a context where we make of COVID-19, where we cannot even hold hearings of a case that has more than 1,300 claimants, among whom we have Celia Ramos, it implies a lot of logistics, including translation to Quechua, uh, as mentioned by my colleague before. We are not pointing out or accepting or denying the case. What we are showing and saying is that we are pointing out that the Peruvian state has been conducting an investigation by means of the public ministry, and now the judicial power has to do its own tasks. It is a complex case, and let's also take into account the amount of people that are included in this case. We are talking about more than 1,300 people, and these people also have the right to manifest, to express themselves, which implies an important activity and a certain amount of time. The Peruvian state concludes, I mean, we are not going to be using the five minutes uh, to, to speak because I think that the essential has probably been mentioned that there is a commitment on behalf of the authorities of the public ministry to devote as much time as possible to this case as soon as possible, understanding the specificities of this case. And secondly, to point out the regulations, what you mentioned about the framework and about the voluntary surgical contraception cases. This has been mentioned before, and as it was said at the beginning, all this information will be sent. Uh, of course, all the text and all the, the background information will be sent in the report that we will send to the commission. Madam President, we do not have 
any further comments? So we thank you for your attention. Thank you to the representation of the state. Now I would like to give the floor to my colleagues. If they have any questions regarding the case, I will first give the, will give the floor to the country reporter, Eduardo Rallon. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to greet both parties in this hearing. I would like to greet especially the brave intervention of one of the daughters of Celia Edith Ramos Duran. And I also would like to greet her sisters. It's very important to have uh, these statements so that we understand better the traumatic situation that you have, been, have gone through. And doing so requires a lot of uh, bravery. First, I would like to ask two questions. One for the petitioners. They mentioned that in this case, uh, the surgical procedure was carried out in unsafe conditions. Um, and I'm not sure if there are any details that you can share with us when you talk about precariousness or unsafe conditions with medications, what uh, equipment was used. What was the situation of that uh, Caserio de la Legua health clinic where the alleged victim was uh, underwent surgery. That is a question for the petitioner. And the second question is for the state. I would like to know if we are in, at the time of the facts, I would like to know if there are any documents that could establish the way the concern, the consent from the people was done before persons went to the health clinic. Uh, there was any document, there was any protocol, how the consent was taken. That is the two questions that I have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rallon. I would like to give the floor to the Rapporteur for Women's Rights, Margaret May McCauley. And I want to remember everybody that we have simultaneous interpretation. Um. Thank you very much, Madam President. Um, I, before I start and greet anyone, I wish to express my heartfelt sympathy to um, the daughters of Cecilia Ramos, um, who so unfortunately became deceased through medical sterilization, which was forced upon her. And that is Maricela, Emily, and Balsa, Balsa Zara. Thank you very much for coming to attend this function. I hope it hasn't been too painful for you. And thank you, Maricela, for relating these circumstances to us. I now um, say a very good afternoon to the representatives of De Demos and uh, who I've worked with over the years and the representatives of the state of Peru. I actually, I have many questions, but I do not think, Madam President, that we have the time. Go for it. So I shall try to um, confine myself to a few. I understand that the, these procedures were uh, um, being undertaken in Peru between 1996 and the year 2000 under the auspices of the National Reproductive Health and Family Planning Program. So I, I have a question for both, uh, both sides, the petitioners and the state. 
can you inform us how many men underwent vasectomy under this program in those years? I ask this question because we have been referred to the Cairo Conference and the Be Beijing Force Conference on Women, which both underline the fact of equality among the sexes, equality of treatment and equity. So could you please inform us of the number of men who what? they underwent the operation of vasectomy under this program in those years. And I wanted to put this particular question to the state. As you all know, I come from a com the common law jurisdiction, a common law jurisdiction. And I am concerned and wish to learn and I hope my colleagues also, even though they belong to the civil law system, would find appropriate. It, it is this. The state has spoken a lot about the fact that investigations are now going on and they have been slowed down by the COVID pandemic. But would you say representatives of the state, that since the investigations were definitively terminated in 1997, in December, that in fact, the state violated its obligation for due diligence in the investigations of this matter. At that date, and up to now, and up to the present time. And I also wish to ask the question of both sides. If you can indicate, one hopes there's data existing, how many middle class women of the elite group, elite class and powerful classes in Peru during those years, the, the relevant years, have suffered and went through the same sterilization family planning proceeding. I, I, my next question was asked by my brother, um, Commissioner Rolong. I, um, I, I think I want to ask, uh, I will ask um, one further question and I will leave the rest for another time. Um, the state, if I, um, heard you all right, say that these obstetric damage suffered by these women, or which were when they were sterilized, and especially Cecilia Ramos, which eventually led to her death. And you say that this the cause of death was not proved. Is it not the state's of duty and obligation to prove the cause of death of one of its citizens who was treated in one of its health establishments? So 
with that, I end my questions, Madam President. Thank you very much. And if the states cannot answer all my questions, I would like to have those answers in writing. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Margaret. We are running out of time, but I also would like to make some comments and some questions because effectively this is an iconic case for Peru and for the region. Uh, precisely this morning, the commission was in a case before the card regarding sexual violence in the context of armed conflicts in Colombia. So abstracting violence is a problem that does not occur only in Peru, but also across the continent. And this is happening across the world. And that's why the different international treaties deal with uh, forced sterilization and they are considered war crimes or genocide in some cases. It's a serious violation of human rights, especially when the procedure uh, affects uh, women, uh, low-income women, Afro-descendant women and indigenous women. And we need to mention that there are also men that have been affected by forced sterilization and also LGBTI persons are victims of forced sterilization. I think that this, in this, this situation is very relevant, not only for Peru, but also for women and men in the country that have suffered forced sterilization. I agree with Commissioner Margaret uh, regarding the due diligence duty of the state of uh, 20 years, over 20 years have elapsed. And first, I would like to talk or to ask the state regarding the current proceeding. And because I know that the case includes 1,300 persons that have been subjected to forced sterilization, and there are five cases of people who have died. And within those cases, Celia Ramos is one of them. So those are the victims of the current proceeding that the Office of the Public Prosecutor is um, conducting. And apart from the Public Prosecution Office, the commission, uh, uh, has talked um, about victims, especially those who have died because of forced sterilization. And, and I know that this year, the victims of forced uh, sterilization have been included in integral or comprehensive reparation law. And I need to have clear information. If a person is included in the record for victims of 2015, and after being acknowledged as a victim for the reparations law, uh, Celia has been included as a victim in the record. I understand that, but I would like to know that the reparations law is responsible for the reparation once a person is included in the record. I would like to know how the record works, how the reparations law works when a victim is recognized as a victim of forced sterilization. That is a question that I have. And regarding the, uh, for the petitioners, I have a question. They talk about non-repetition measures, training of health professionals in the area of reproductive health, and also previous informed uh, and written consent as a guarantee of non-repetition, but I would like to listen to the orders of Mrs. Celia regarding which reparations they are expecting for as victims. I know that uh, we don't have much time. You will have five minutes to answer the questions. So the information that you do not give us now, please send it by reading. Now I would like to give the floor first to the petitioner for five minutes and then to the state for five minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam President. 
again, we would like to thank the commission for the opportunity that the three daughters of Mrs. Celia have with this hearing. I will speak first and then uh, the daughters of Mrs. Celia will be able to speak and we will be sending uh, all the answers in written. The unsafe conditions of La Lewa Health Clinic. This um, health clinic is located in a very poor area. In 1997, that area was very poor. There was a 70, 80% of poverty. There were uh, very precarious uh, housing facilities. And to check or to verify the precariousness, you have the documents from the police and you have the statements of several people. And one of them is Jose Estaque. He was the president of the community. He coordinated the program with health uh, professionals. He saw the surgical procedure of Mrs. Celia Ramos. When the nurses went to buy painkillers, he saw it. The nurses did not have painkillers for a situation like this. So what else can you expect? We will give you more information in written. I would like to give the floor to uh, my colleague Maria Isabel now. I call upon the state of Peru to read the report of the Ombudsperson Office, that is report number seven and report number 27, so that you could learn about the case and the conclusions of the investigation carried out by the Ombudsperson Office. And it concludes that there is a link uh, between the administration of medication and the cause of death. Why? The post-surgical complications of Celio Ramos were not uh, covered or addressed at uh, Caserio de la Legua Health Clinic. The representatives of the Ministry of Health can help us because there is no ICU in these health clinics because there are no conditions for post-surgical proceedings. That's why they transfer her to a private health center. They could not take care of her. After what I have discussed with Maricela and Emilia and Marcia, Maricela is the, is the eldest and she remembers more. You go to these health clinics, when you go to a neighborhood, when you need an ibuprofen, when you have a pain and that's it. Pay attention to this data, 15 women were uh, underwent the same procedure, the same uh, surgical procedure in the, on the same day. They told her that it was a short, small, clinical procedure and from eight in the morning to eight in the afternoon, could you uh, operate 15 women on the same day? Representatives of the Ministry of Health, which neighborhood health clinic are prepared and equipped to conduct a sterilization the uh, Celia suffered from a cardiac arrest because of the medication she received and you couldn't take care of her. There are precarious conditions and that is on the report of the Ombudsperson Office. Please, uh, please 
take this into consideration uh, or honorable commission when they analyze the responsibility of the state. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you. I would like to give the floor to the state now for five minutes. Thank you, Madam President. We have written down all the questions. Most of the questions will, we will need the questions in written because of the level of complexity, but we can provide some information regarding the questions you made. Regarding the question made by Commissioner Estuardo Relon regarding the documents that was requested regarding the consent, that information we will will be presented in the report that we will be sending to you. That will be included in that report. And regarding the question made by Commissioner Margaret regarding how many men were uh, subject to sterilization, first we need to say that this information in Peru is systematized as of 2016 onwards. In the past, that information was not included, was not documented. And there are no file, there are, might be some physical files, but due to the pandemic and the workers are not working full time, so we will try to find the information and to present that information in that report. Also, uh, there was uh, also a question regarding due diligence um and no access to justice has been guaranteed after so many years the representatives mentioned the number of proceedings and how many times the state of peru reopened the case we need to take that into consideration and also regarding your question madam president this case includes 1,300 victims that suffer serious injuries, and they are all important within the criminal proceeding. And we have five victims that suffer serious injuries followed by death. And this title of serious injuries is the crime type uh, assigned by the Public Prosecu Prosecution Office. And then the judiciary will determine the arguments presented by the Public Prosecution Office. Uh, regarding uh, the damage of women, I have talked about that regarding the criminal proceeding in Peru and how it works. I have uh, covered that already. We have uh, written down your questions and we will include the answers in our written report and in order to conclude our presentation, we would like to mention the following. We have listened uh, to the reports of the ombudsperson. We know about those reports. We know that the role of the ombudsperson office is fundamental, especially uh, for the state of Peru. And we are certain that those reports will be considered as evidence by the judiciary in Peru. We have said that the ones that have to make a decision is the jurisdiction or the court that has the jurisdiction. And taking into consideration the evidence, they will make a decision on the case. Thank you, Madam President, for your attention. We are finishing our presentation with this. Thank you very much. Madam President. Honorable Commission. Madam President. Well, I think she might have lost contact for a bit and Marisol and, and um, um, Commissioner Rallon, I just want to, make, to mention something. I, I do apologize to Marcia Marabel Ramos because my eyes missed her out. And Marcia, I do enjoin you in my sympathy to your sisters, all you, the daughters of uh, your mother, Cecilia. So Marcia, please accept my sympathy as well. And then could I just mention to the state 
that there is a typographical error in your opening your cover page of your documents as you refer to 107 this is the, that this is the 174th period of sessions when it's the 179th Um, Strado, you being the country rapporteur, you will have you have the lead since um, we have lost Madam President. I think is she coming back? Have we lost? Commissioner? I think we lost her. No, I think we lost Antonia. I think Madam President has lost her connection. So I will take the floor. We are, um, uh, well, we have to wrap up this hearing. This is this will be the end of this hearing, but I would just like uh, to make a reminder at the end. First of all, I would like to thank both parties because of your participation, because of all the information that you've given us in this hearing, the participation of the, um, uh, petitioners on the one hand and on the state, both of you contribute to our tasks and to our work. Both parties can send the information in writing within a month, starting from today. So because of time constraints and time issues and because of connection problems, such as the case of the president now, uh, in this case, myself as the rapporteur for the country will make this reminder and Following this reminder, I will close the hearing and I thank you all for your participation. Thank you. Maria I'm sorry. Can I say something else? Maricela says. Okay, thank you. Thank you all.